Hey guys, welcome back to our channel. It's a girlfriend Lungu back with another reaction video. If you're new to this channel, make sure to give this video a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and of course, do not forget to subscribe. Like I said, my name is Fanny Lungu, and we post reactions each and every day. So if there's something in particular that you guys want us to react to, let us know by dropping the link in the comment section below, and we'll be more than glad to do it. So this video is going to be in two parts and we're going to be reacting to the Quran and Lock Secrets of Ancient Egypt. Interesting. So without wasting time, a big shout out to the person that suggested this. Without wasting time, let's get into the video. Egypt, land of the pyramids and pharaohs. One of the most studied and scrutinized civilizations of the ancient world. And yet it remains veiled in mystery. In this video, we are going to see that the Qur'an reveals secrets about Egypt that until recently were lost to mankind. Pharaoh was a tyrant in Egypt, enslaving and persecuting the children of Israel. The Qur'an states the following about the death of Pharaoh and his supporters. Note the words, heaven and earth wept not for them. A recently unearthed pyramid text has granted us new insights into the meaning of this verse. The pyramid text reads, The sky weeps for you, the earth weeps for you, when you ascend to heaven as a star. Here, the pyramid text praises Pharaoh, claiming that upon his death he will ascend through the sky and claim supremacy of the heavens by becoming a star. We can see that the Qur'an quotes the pyramid text directly in its rebuttal of Egyptian adulations of Pharaoh. What's amazing is that knowledge of the ancient Egyptian language of hieroglyphics was lost to mankind at the time the Qur'an was revealed. It wasn't until the discovery of an artifact known as the Rosetta Stone in the 18th century, over a thousand years after the revelation of the Qur'an, that mankind has been able to fully decode the hieroglyphics. When you hear the word Pharaoh, what comes into your mind? Most people think of the supreme ruler of Egypt. This is correct, but the word did not always refer to the supreme ruler. Ancient Egyptian history is divided into different periods. The word Pharaoh, Egyptian, Pera, had different meanings depending on the period of Egyptian history. Historically, the word Pharaoh only started being used as a title for the supreme ruler much later in Egyptian history, during the New Kingdom period. Before this, the word meant Great House and was used to refer to the Royal Palace. The Encyclopedia Britannica states, Pharaoh, originally the Royal Palace in ancient Egypt. The word came to be used for the Egyptian king under the New Kingdom. Let's now analyse the Qur'an's accounts about Egypt in light of these historical facts. Like the Bible, the Qur'an discusses the prophets Joseph and Moses, who both spent time in Egypt. Joseph is dated by scholars to either the Middle Kingdom or Second Intermediate Period, well before Pharaoh meant ruler. In the story of Joseph, the Qur'an repeatedly uses the word king to refer to the ruler of Egypt. He is never once called Pharaoh. Moses is dated by scholars to the New Kingdom period. In the story of Moses, the Qur'an repeatedly calls the ruler Pharaoh. He is never called king. We can see that the Qur'an is accurate in its use of language when it comes to describing the leader of Egypt at different periods in its history. How could the author of the Qur'an have known this? The only source of information about ancient Egypt that would have been readily available are the Bible-based stories. To claim that the Qur'an copied from the Bible is problematic because the Bible uses the word Pharaoh to refer to the Egyptian ruler in the story of Joseph, which is historically inaccurate. The Qur'an cannot have copied from the Bible because the Qur'an corrects the Bible. The Bible explicitly states that at the time of the Exodus, the Israelite men were vast in number. The Israelites journeyed from Ramesses to Sukkoth. There were about 600,000 men on foot, 
besides women and children. If we factor in the women and children, then the total number of Israelites would realistically be in the millions. This claim of a vast nation is problematic in light of other information that the Bible provides. Firstly, Pharaoh is said to have appointed two midwives to deliver and murder Israelite babies. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shipra and Puah, when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. Two midwives would only be sufficient for such a task if the Israelites were small in number and giving birth to a manageable number of babies. Two midwives would not be sufficient for a vast nation of millions. Secondly, the Bible tells us that after the Exodus, God informed Israel that they would not be granted the land of their enemies straight away. But I will not drive them out in a single year, because the land would become desolate and the wild animals too numerous for you. Little by little, I will drive them out before you, until you have increased enough to take possession of the land. Note the reason for the Israelites being denied immediate possession of the land. It is said that wild animals will overpower them. Such a statement only makes sense if the Israelites were small in number and not a vast nation of millions as the Bible claims. By contrast, the Quran states that the Israelites were only a small band at the time of Moses. We can see that the Quran fixes the contradictions that are present in the biblical narrative. The Quran states that the punishment of crucifixion was used in ancient Egypt from the time of Moses all the way back to the time of Joseph. Now the word crucifixion typically brings to mind the Roman cross. However, in antiquity, there were different forms of crucifixion. Professor of archeology, span David Chapman wrote, In studying the ancient world, the scholar is wise not to differentiate too rigidly the categories of crucifixion, impalement, and suspension. Hence, any study of crucifixion conceptions in antiquity must grapple with the broader context of the wide variety of penal suspension of human beings. The Arabic words translated as crucified in the Quranic verses all contain the root word, solaba. Arabic dictionaries state that this root carries a number of meanings, including to harden or stiffen and to extract oily matter from bones. This word does not only mean death by being hung on a Roman cross. Rather, it indicates any method of execution which makes the body hardened or stiffened and results in the leaking of bodily fluids. So, impalement, suspension, and the Roman cross are all included without making any distinction. Archaeological evidence shows that the ancient Egyptians used to crucify people by impalement on a stake. The following entry is taken from an Egyptian German dictionary of hieroglyphics. Note the hieroglyph which depicts an impaled man. This is a punishment that was used throughout the different periods of ancient Egypt. The Abbot Papyrus is dated to the New Kingdom period. It mentions an oath that includes impalement. He took an oath on pain of being beaten and of being impaled. The earliest evidence for crucifixion by impalement is Papyrus Bulak 18, which is dated to the early second intermediate period. It states, A bloodbath had occurred with wood. The comrade was put on the stake. We can see that crucifixion by impalement on a stake was carried out during the New Kingdom period, and at least as far back as the Second Intermediate Period. These time periods cover both Moses and Joseph, which shows that the Quran is historically accurate. As well as mentioning crucifixion, the Quran also narrates the following threat of mutilation made by the Pharaoh of Moses. Historically we know 
that capital punishment in ancient Egypt became more severe with the advent of the New Kingdom period, which is the time of Moses. In fact, the specific punishment of mutilation is primarily associated with the New Kingdom period. For example, the Turin Judicial Papyrus records, persons to whom was done punishment by severing their nose and ears on account of them ignoring the good instruction said to them. These details about crucifixion and mutilation are missing in the Bible. There is a Jewish commentary, the Midrash Shemot Rabbah, which mentions Pharaoh threatening Moses with burning and crucifixion. But this is a much later work that was composed centuries after the Quran was revealed. Neither the Bible nor Quran identifies the Pharaoh of Moses by name. We can use the details provided in the scriptures to try to identify the Pharaoh. Both scriptures speak of the Israelites being taken into slavery before the birth of Moses. The use of Semites for slave labour occurred only during the New Kingdom period. So, we can place Moses somewhere in the New Kingdom period. This gives us a list of 33 possible pharaohs. Both scriptures also speak of an exodus of the Israelites out of Egypt. The Menepta Stele is an important artefact that contains the first explicit reference to Israel in the archaeological record. It is dated to around 1208 BCE. It discusses the land of Canaan and mentions the Israelites in relation to Canaan, indicating that the exodus had already taken place by this date. The artefact is contemporaneous to the pharaoh Menepta. This means that the exodus had to take place before Menepta, since Menepta was alive and in power after the exodus and not drowned in the sea. This establishes an upper boundary in the timeline of the pharaohs. From the point of view of both the Bible and Quran, we are now left with 18 pharaohs as candidates who may have ruled during the time of Moses. Let's now delve deeper into the biblical narrative. The Bible claims that there were two different pharaohs who were in power. The first died while Moses was in hiding in Midian. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses, but Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian. During that long period, the king of Egypt died. The new pharaoh continued his predecessor's persecution of the Israelites, and it was the second pharaoh who was later drowned when Moses crossed the sea. The Bible gives us a timeline for these events. The burning bush encounter with God took place when Moses was 80 years old. So from his birth to the Exodus, there was a span of at least 80 years, during which two pharaohs ruled Egypt. Now, there is a big problem if we compare this biblical narrative to the timeline of the pharaohs. We've seen that the Bible claims exactly two pharaohs ruled during the 80 year period from the birth of Moses to the Exodus. If we consider the number of years that each of the pharaohs ruled, we can see that there is no 80 year period during which only two pharaohs ruled. Any given 80 year period will give you at least three pharaohs in power. We can see that the biblical narrative contradicts the historical evidence. Let's now compare the Quranic narrative. Unlike the Bible, the Quran depicts a single pharaoh reigning from the birth of Moses all the way up to the Exodus. The Quran informs us that Moses fled to Midian when he reached the age of maturity. The Quran defines the age of maturity as 40 years old. The Quran also informs us that during his time in Midian, Moses spent eight to 10 years in the service of his father-in-law before returning to Egypt to face Pharaoh. This means that Moses was at least 48 years of age when the Exodus happened. The only Pharaoh during the New Kingdom period who had such a lengthy reign as an absolute ruler was Ramesses II, who ruled for 66 years. The Quranic account is perfectly in line with the historical evidence and fixes the chronological issues that are present in the biblical narrative. Let's now compare the life and religion of Ramesses II to the claims that the Quran makes about the Pharaoh of Moses. 
في الأرض وإنه لمن المسرفين. This claim that the Pharaoh of Moses was extravagant has been proven by archaeological discoveries, which show that Ramesses II was the grandest of the pharaohs. The archaeologist Peter Clayton wrote, His genuine building achievements are on a Herculean scale. The archaeologist Eric Uphill wrote, The palace of Ramesses was probably the vastest and most costly royal residence ever erected by the hand of man. The Egyptologist Kenneth Kitchen wrote, Certainly, in his building works for the gods, Ramesses II surpassed not only the 18th dynasty, but every other period. Very interesting. I'm just wondering, how does someone rule for 66 years, but then when we listen to this video, someone is bringing up 48. What am I missing here? And it's very, very interesting. I mean, it's always good to compare two different works, the Quran and the Bible. And at the end of the day, some people will not accept what this video is saying. They'll say the Bible is right. Some will argue that the Quran is right. It's really up to us to also, um, if we are committed to this topic, for us to go out there and do our own research. If we are agreeing with the Quran, then that's that. If we are agreeing with the, what the Bible says, then that's that. Otherwise, if you believe there are mistakes in the Bible, if you believe there are mistakes in the Quran, that's your own personal choice that you have to make at the end of the day.